Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 8. Coming up on this show, we've got reflective apparitions of time, when an entity comes knocking, and river-tubing demonic incursions in Nebraska. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. Welcome back. I'm glad that you can come back to give us hot, spicy content like river-tubing demonic incursions. I didn't know what tubing was. I had to look what? it up. I was, I was reading this book today. You don't know what tubing is? No idea what tubing was. Trust the light. Eternal life. Oh, dear. I wouldn't normally read this kind of book, especially for the show. But then I read the byline, which is UFO whistleblower. UFO encounters that led me to Jesus Christ. And the whole center of this story is tubing. <laughs> and I was like, what is tubing? You've never heard of tubing. Well, I know what it is now, but no, I'd never heard of the term tubing. So you sit in a tube and you float down the river with a beer, right? That's my understanding of well, it now. Well, sometimes at other times you're like strung behind a speedboat and you get pulled along and it could be a lot of fun. How do you know what tubing is? You've never been tubing. They just do it over the back of Coolum. Do they? Yeah. <laughs> so like just the What's next it called? Over. Coolum River Tubing. No, it's like the Coolum Water Park or something. Yeah, I've just never heard it called tubing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do they call it here? They call it something else here. Tubing. They don't call it tubing. Oh, I've you know never what? Heard we, are, we are a bit backwards here in Queensland. Sometimes it's called banana boating. Exactly. If if the he said I was, I was saved by Jesus while banana boating, <laughs> I would have thought, okay, I know what this story is about. Okay. I'm totally on board. Fair what enough. is tubing? So what you you get in this inflatable tube and you float down the river. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you pull behind a boat. It's great. Well, all of that happens in this river in Nebraska, except there's weird men in black uh, attacking your tubing business. Like your tubing business is under attack from triangular-shaped UFOs, weird men in black in the bushes, um, mantis-like entities. Why? Because someone saw a UFO while they were sitting in a tube? It's all got to do with this tubing business. <laughs> it's from Jeremiah Johnson, who, okay. who ran this uh, tubing enterprise with his uncle Fred in Nebraska. I think tubing and enterprise <laughs> is a contradiction of terms. No, these guys fine. were... In 2017, they had the whole tubing market locked down in this particular river area in Nebraska. Have I got their um oh That's no, a- I don't have my I don't have my screen sharing set up. But it was it's called uh Tank and Tube River Rides Now. And they've changed the name, but before it was called it was called Uncle Uncle Fred's something like Uncle Fred's River something but the acronym something corny, right? Something starting with O. The acronym was UFO. So they start this business, this tubing business in Nebraska called UFO. Mm -hmm. And after about two years of dominating the tubing industry, UFOs start showing up over their business. What? Yeah. What, suggesting that like somehow by just simply using the term UFO, it had attracted UFOs? It did something. Okay. And uh, I think Jesus was there to save them (laughs) from the... UFOs taking over their tubing business. I'm so glad you're back. That's what's coming up. I'm so pleased you're back. Well, that's coming up in a got extension towards the end of the show. For this show, actually, though, I wanted to look at something a little bit different. I ended up uh, kicking off from the book Travels Through Time Inside the Fourth Dimension, Time Travel and Stacked Time Theory. This is by Mike uh, Ricksecker. And we've covered some of his works in the past. He's a really fascinating guy. Comes out with some pretty unusual perceptions as to what is going on with a whole range of different types of paranormal phenomena. Uh, But in this particular book, it focuses on the possibility that a lot of the stuff that we experience in regards to hauntings, poltergeist activity, um, demonic possessions, well, that's kind of what I go into later on, but it could be to do with time as opposed to it actually being something like a a stone tape haunting. You know, the whole idea of stone tape where a scene will play over and over and over again. It's actually to do with the nature of time and how we're immersed in what could essentially, and I've spoken about this, about time being a substance in another dimension that we're essentially, uh, it's a malleable substance. It can move, it can be warped around, and even quantum physics is starting to suggest that that might be a possibility as well. So for this particular book, I wanted to go through uh, some of the encounters here, looking at ghost experiences from a time travel perspective. And then I'm going to flesh that out with some of these other stories that kind of tie in with this very nicely. I'm not going to go into too great a detail about some of his his theories, like stack time theory, that kind of stuff. I'll link to the book in the show notes so you can check that out for yourself. So no tubing content. There is no tubing content. Oh, I see. Now you put it up on the the screen. See, that looks pretty cool. This is Americana. Look at that. It is Americana. It's like summer camp. I've been to America a bunch of times and I've I've always just been to the fancy places. Well, like clearly you've never actually and, really well, been though. Yeah, I've been to New York and Los Angeles and a few other places, but I have never been tubing like this. 
this looks like the real America to me. You know, and I want a part of it. You also need to take a ATV, a four-wheeler, and drive it through the Grand Canyon and smash into a cactus. You've done that? I've done that. <laughs> Just the only time. Actually, it's the second time in my life where I actually thought, oh my God, this is where I'm going to die. <laughs> so there was something wrong with the the steering and I just couldn't sure there was it was <laughs> yeah, I couldn't sure get it out, and it just went and of course I went straight to a cactus and the cactus is actually what saved my life is it really I, yeah if I'd kept on going I would have got over the edge so it's like okay. oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a fun uh Live leak video. It would have, yeah, that would have been Dumb great. Dumb Aussie tourist was... going over the edge of the canyon. Uh, normally, it's a German tourist. Well, you just like straight no. all the way down, <laughs> straight. Yeah, with my uh, my hat on, and a crocodile in my arm, and off I go. Bloody hell, man! Yeah, probably not. It's not Smash. that bad. So let's jump into some of these experiences first. We've got a bunch of videos actually talking about Australian stories. We're going to be covering some Australian stuff. I've got this great old Australian documentary where I've pulled out some of the classic stories that kind of fit with this. Um, that suggests that this phenomenon, of course, you know, if it is some type of time distortion or what do you want to call it, time anomaly, uh, it's something that would happen globally. It happens everywhere to, to lots of people. But where I want to start off actually is where Mike was referring to uh, The Conjuring House. So if you recall, Ben, The Conjuring House, this was a film that came out called The Conjuring. It came out in, in 2013. And uh, it was one of those horror films that, you know, a- a- attract, you know, a certain kind of uh, group of people. And um, that's not being negative. It's just like horror movie kind of goers. But it actually was bigger than that. It attracted a lot of attention from the public. And it related to Ed and Lorraine Warrens, you know, the, the great investigators, uh, their investigations of the Perrin farmhouse in 1973. Yeah, right. Okay. So you've just brought up the, the, the uh, trailer to The Conjuring film. But this film depicted this family who moved into a rustic old house and were tormented by a demonic spirit. This demonic spirit was known as uh, Bathsheba, and uh, apparently it it possessed the mother, Carolyn. But Mike writes that this is actually not true of what happened in reality. Obviously, this is a sensationalized remake of this particular experience. Uh, The home in Harrisville on Rhode Island is actually a, a very different experience. The haunting of the Parent family lasted for actually 10 years. It was 10 years this family was subjected to this strange phenomenon in their home. Uh, and this was the entire length of their, their residence there. Now, it's believed that this particular house was built sometime probably in the 1730s, but no one is in, entirely sure. The exact date is very difficult to verify. But it's been the, the hotspot of you know, many bizarre and strange supernatural phenomenon types of experiences. And he actually, Mike, refers to Andrea uh, Perrin's book. It was a trilogy called House of Darkness, House of Light. And that chronicles that 10 years of uh, experiences mm. that they had in great detail. I'm on the website right now. You can book it. Can you really? <laughs> it just says book now, <laughs> The Conjuring House, what, what, circa 1736. Do you stay overnight or something in this house? I don't know. Well, click on experiences up the top there. Okay, experiences. Okay, so it's saying experiences. The activity here grants us a chance for a personal connection in accordance with what we... Shut up. (laughs) What is this? Which haunt lures you? Special events. Oh, so it's like tours. And House you can go tours. Investigation. Okay, yeah, look, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Oh, you can do camping. and So you can stay over. Glamping. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Is that ghost camping? It is. Oh, it's, it's ghost camping. 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 Ghost camping. The ultimate paranormal outdoor adventure. Look, I've got no issue with them trying to make something out of it. It's certainly a hotspot of, of some kind. Can we book a yurt and stay at the Conjuring House? I'm beyond that now. I'm just, I'm too old for a yurt. I just, I'll, I'll go, I'll you live just, at that. You just crash one of the ATVs <laughs> straight through the house. Like, fair dinkum. <laughs> straight through. With a bottle of 4X in my hand. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, no worries, mate. So, uh, look, what, what he's, Mike says is that uh, the details actually that were written in Andrea Perrin's book uh, better portray what really happened here. And it wasn't that it was uh, necessarily this demonic haunting that, take, that took place. It was actually a seance that had gone terribly, terribly wrong. So, once again, it's like you start dabbling with this stuff. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise, things happen. All the cult sex magic practitioners well, just happen to be involved. Yeah. They just happen to be there. You know, you threw your bowls and par- <laughs> sorry, your keys in a paranormal bowl and see what happens. So during the ceremony, uh, apparently a, a medium had been brought to the house actually by the Warrens. But this is standard. Ed and Lorraine Warren would do that. They had people that were sensitive and they would take them to their investigations, trying to, you know, claw out more information about, you know, what they're experiencing. But they brought this medium into the house. And as, as soon as they did and they were conducting this seance, something 
caught hold of Carolyn and lifted her up in a chair and threw her back across the dining room, apparently, into the parlor. Like a very horror movie style kind of experience taking place. And she was knocked out. Now, apparently, her husband, Roger, uh, tried to tend to her, but Ed insisted that Roger leave her alone because some entity still might have some control over her. But according to the story, Roger would not have anything to do with that, and he promptly uh, pushed Ed away uh, and escorted the Warrens from their premises, and they they never came back. Ed and Lorraine Warren never came back into this house ever again. But of course, um, you know, Carolyn would recover from these uh, this experience, this particular experience, but the hauntings would continue. And it just so happens one of these experiences where you think, well, what does that have to do with time? Like, why would he talk about this weird haunting? How does it fit in with time? Well, a couple of weeks later, Carolyn was still trying to recover. Like, she wasn't completely recovered, but she was doing okay. She wasn't eating well. She was spending a lot of time sleeping. It actually does sound like, I mean, really, it sounds like depression, but it also sounds like if you have had an encounter with some type of entity, it would cause some type of Mm. physical drain upon you. So she asked her eldest daughter, Andrea, uh, to help take care of the rest of the children. And apparently, uh, Carolyn awoke one evening. Andrea was still awake doing housework and that kind of stuff. And she just asked Andrea, she said, look, can you heat up some of the leftovers? I really feel like I can I can eat. And Andrea's like, yeah, yeah, sure, not a problem. So she goes downstairs and she starts preparing. But apparently it was while Andrea was uh, downstairs preparing, Carolyn was sitting in the parlor. And I'll, I'll quote this. All of a sudden, the dining room beyond her morphed into existence an entire family in the room. Fully formed and judging by the pewter steins on the table, they were from the 17th century. Like she's got this vision taking place before her, but it's not a vision. It's like if you have a hallucination or if you have like something appear in your line of sight, you normally have enough wherewithal to know that you're actually having a hallucination or you know that you know there's something going on. But for her, she's like, no, no, the entire scene just changed before her. It materialized before her. And the fireplace, so there's this fireplace in the corner of this house, which has been boarded up for a hundred years. It's been sealed up. This fireplace was wide open. It was burning. There was a fire that she could see. Um, There was a woman in a dated dress that was leaning over it cooking. There were small children running through the room. So they're not suggesting these are ghosts. They're saying she got a vision of the past. Yes, she experienced some kind of time slip. If you will, it's not like the, the all these people are haunting the house. Oh, exactly right, and that's what a lot of these stories start to fit into. It suggests that what is occurring here is not some type of uh, haunting, um, you know, or like I, as I point out, the stone tape theory. And normally with the stone tape theories, and this will become apparent in a moment, right? Normally with residual hauntings, stone tape hauntings, you have it that you go into a certain location, and when people see a ghost, it will never interact with you. There's no interaction with the investigator, the witnesses, or people living in the home. But what it will do is it will repeat the same activity over and over and over again. It's like this snippet of an event that will take place. Uh, And usually that's associated with some type of traumatic event, but other times not. Uh, But in this particular case, right, where this becomes a little bit more unusual is the fact that as Carolyn's sitting there just taking this all in, trying to understand what's going on before her, she said she sees that there's two gentlemen seated at a table just uh, before her, and they've got the steins in front of them. They look directly at Carolyn, and one of the gentlemen, in complete and utter disbelief, remarked to the other, she actually heard this, well, would you look at that? Who's this wench? As if, yeah, exactly. That's manifested in my yes, drawing room. It, it really was. <laughs> it really was like that. It was as if she was the ghost. It wasn't the other way around. Now, where this story would be you know, even more you know, intriguing would be is that if some 17th century you know, gentleman had written, Whereeth wench appeared before thy yeah. and disappeared. Yeah, is like, it in the family journal? That hasn't been revealed. But it is intriguing that this actually sets up the possibility that this particular location, the reason why it's, it's so haunted and so strange, it's not haunted because it's haunted by entities, spirits, wraiths, ghosts. It's haunted by time. It's haunted by there's something going on. And I would say the past, but it's not necessarily the past. It, it's it's anywhere in time, but this stuff is crossing over. So I add, So that's the theme from Rick Secker. Yeah. So in time travels what, through time. What what uh Mike also writes, he says, look, when you look at the book series, you actually find out that uh Andrea said that this historic home was actually a portal cleverly disguised 
as a farmhouse. What? Right? And Mike says, I happen to agree. How can we disguise this portal? I don't know. Let's yeah. build a farmhouse look, around it. This gets this to me, like this whole idea of like we talk about there being uh, interdimensional gateways and window areas all around the world. But mm. we normally refer to the possibility of people crossing into other dimensions or UFOs. It's not really about ghosts. But what this is, this is like some type of uh, time gateway or uh, some type of anomaly right. in this location that relates so, to time. If there was some kind of time gateway near a river, for example, you would build like a tubing business <laughs> to disguise the river portal. You know what you do? This would actually, because if it works the same way, because in Andrea's house, she claims that apparently a supernatural bubble would periodically manifest upstairs in which she and her younger sisters would go into this space. And when they went in there, like into this bubble that somehow was brewing. What, they could see it? it? She doesn't say she could see it. She just said it was a bubble and they would walk into it. And when they walked into it, a whole range of weird activity would take place. Now that's not described either in Mike's work. Perhaps it's described in her book, Um, but they would be in there for 20, 30 minutes. Like it was a long time and they would experience, and I quote, off the wall paranormal activity. And yet when they exited, the amount of time that had actually passed had only been about two minutes. Oh, so it's like this distortion. And like they're saying paranormal off-the-wall activity. Well, what are you actually experiencing when you're going through there? Uh, it's all very strange, but I thought, you know, this actually is a good explanation for what happens in a, in a lot of these uh, experiences of what people are seeing. We always go to it being a ghost. We always go to it being a spirit when people just... Because you're not in the know, right? Most Because it's a cultural thing as well. Tell me how many movies there really are about you know the the idea of you know time slips appearing in people's homes. It's it's not that much, but it's none, so, very few. But it goes that kind of everyone knows it. It's all part of our culture. So immediately when you see oh, what something, what about that Jean Claude Jean Claude Van Damme one? Not Time Cop. That counts. No, it, t- <laughs> it does. And that doesn't count at all. Yeah, doesn't he go into a bubble at the start and then his twin well, comes what, in? So the Terminator counts as well. <laughs> So that's not really the point. Because with this stuff as well, it's uh, in that circumstance, that's deliberate, right? This is a very natural phenomenon that we don't necessarily understand. And where this is repeated later on, he says, look, another location where this happens quite frequently, and of course it happens all around the world, is Route 66. You know, we know Route 66 as being this you know, legendary, legendary route, you know, that travels across America through Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma. You know, it's, it's all well known. But of course, since, you know, the new roadways have come up and, you know, the world has changed, people don't travel through there anymore. But when you start looking into some of the history, the more unusual history of Route 66, there's this long and interesting um, pattern mm. of what is paranormal activity in regards to phantom hitchhikers? That kind of stuff. And this is why it's kind of like known as the mother road of this type of activity. Hold that thought. Time cop trailer. What do you see? First 10 seconds. <laughs> time bubble. Freaking time bubble. Jean-Claude Van Damme walks into the 1920s through a time bubble. I rest my case. Okay, I'll give you that one then. You got that one. <laughs> That's fine. Um, but there was this other story, right? Which because we hear so many of these stories, we heard a lot about the the phantom hitchhiker phenomenon, you know, after traumatic events. One, of course, being the the Fukushima uh, Daiichi disaster with the um, you know people in in that particular area, you know, saying that taxi drivers would be driving along and all of a sudden they'd pick up someone who was wet. Yeah, that's right. You know, and they'd get into the vehicle and ask to be taken home. And as soon as they you know, they'd feel something and they'd turn around, and the person had gone. But they were traveling at speed. There's no way that and the door didn't open. Like, how does this kind of stuff happen? Well, when you look into Route 66, this kind of stuff is reported all the time. Um, there was one particular story that runs from El Reno in Oklahoma, and uh, just on the outskirts of this particular town, there was this vagabond that was known to wander around this particular location. And um, you know, people it became known as this urban legend of this vagabond hanging around because he was the epitome of a phantom hitchhiker. He would climb into someone's car and he would disappear. It was this classic kind of case, except for... There was this one outstanding case where one person actually managed to entice him into the car and described him as being an eerie little man. That's the only way that they described him. But without warning, as if he was kind of thinking about his decision to get into the vehicle, the guy freaked out and then tried to jump from the car. Who, the little man? Yeah. It was almost like he was interacting with the the driver. Like It's almost like he it's not a recurrent kind of residual haunting. Mm. It's that he was actually interacting with the current time frame, the current events. And of course, this is repeated in a whole range of stories. There's stories from Australia of where it was like this large black Commodore 
Uh, it's kind of like a Lincoln Town car, I suppose. And uh, this was seen, you know, drive in the 1980s, driving through a suburban, um, I think it was a Sydney street. But as it was driving along, the eyewitness in this particular report said that, of course, she experienced the Oz factor. She said she couldn't hear anything, so everything went silent. But as she looked and saw this vehicle going past, because the vehicle was just so astonishingly old, of course, it, it grabbed her attention because it was so unique. And it was this, you know, 1950s kind of vehicle. It can't have been a Commodore. It must have been something different to that, but, you know, a very a limousine-style car. And when um, she's looking at it, apparently the occupants, there was two men in, in the vehicle, they were looking like they were terrified. <laughs> they were shocked. It was like they were confused and terrified at what they were seeing. And then, of course, uh, she said she heard a noise, so she turned her head to check the noise. And when she looks back, the vehicle was gone and all the sound had returned because the sound had returned from this initial kind of shock. So it suggests that, again, another experience of where it's not a haunting. It's like even though she was having the experience, something had come into her time, from the perspective of the people that she's looking mm. at, which must be from another time, she's invading their space. So there could be people from like 1930s Australia and they teleport to Sydney in 2024 and they just think they're in China or India. <laughs> They'll just be like, what did, we, we teleported to another country. Yeah, they're probably soldiers and they're like, oh, we fought the Second World War for this? Oh, geez, that's <laughs> terrible. That is awful. I take that back. So, no, um, you don't. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right in, in a sense. Like, I know you're joking, but um, this is possibly what's occurring. It's like these are all, because there's a ridicule factor attached to it as well, people are less likely to report it. They're less likely to give their names. They're less likely to document it. So we don't have these records to be like, oh yeah, on this particular date, these people saw this. And then decades later, we can verify it. We're going, well, this particular woman saw this. If there was some database of this kind of stuff, mm. you might actually start getting proof. And perhaps there is somewhere that people are doing this, but it's, I think it's very rare. Uh, of course, you know, there's also uh, in the Bridgewater Triangle in Massachusetts, which is also known as being, you know, a hotspot of paranormal activity. Well, there's a redheaded hitchhiker that hangs around and interacts with, with drivers as well. And as soon as he gets into the car, he has a discussion with them. He seemingly is confused about where he is. He leaps out of the vehicle. Yeah, there's many of those there's hitchhiker a lot of, stories, the phantom hitchhiker yeah, stories. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of those stories out there. So I thought, okay, well, you know, let's dig a little bit deeper. So I'll, I'll link to that particular book in the show notes. It goes into, you know, the, the classics. We know the Robert Victor Goddard story, the British, you know, Royal Air Force guy who was, you know, remember how he was flying through, and, he, and this is really important though, actually, to set up this next part, is that he flew through a, an odd cloud bank. Like he flew through this cloud bank. And this as, is the story from the 40s, right? It's 1935. Right. And as he flew through, uh, he looked down and he saw what was supposed to be an, uh, an abandoned Air Force base or an airfield. And he saw these a very modern aircraft and um, like m not super modern, but modern aircraft uh, with different colors on them that he didn't expect. And he's like, oh, this is really strange. And as soon as this um, cloud bank kind of disappeared. He looks back down and it's returned to normal. Uh, two years later, 1937, it just so happens that that particular airfield is fired back up and the aircraft that he saw, a new aircraft, a training aircraft that they brought in with particular colours on them. That's right. So he experienced this is this. He saw the airborne, new uniforms, the new planes, the new colours. That's right, yeah. He experienced this airborne time slip. Is that one documented or is it just a internet legend is that just a story that's been repeated or did he actually write this down no he wrote this down right. yeah he published this so this is and he, like he put his name to it as well so the fact that he went and did that is you know quite outstanding um but the the depiction of the cloud i thought was fascinating because i thought okay where have we kind of covered this kind of concept before and i thought ah oh, time bubble time storms Jenny Randalls. Jay Randalls. Jenny Randalls. Now, we know that book extremely well. I'll link to it in the show notes so you can check that out for yourself. I'll link to an episode where we've covered it before. But I wanted to have a look around to see if Jenny Randalls has covered anything that's you know that's similar to that. And it just so happens that there's an old magazine called Project Red Book. Uh, and Project Red Book actually spoke to Jenny Randalls uh, around the time of publication of, uh, of Time Storms. But she actually included a couple of stories that uh, we've never really gone into in great detail. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really, really fascinating. So the, the first one that comes up, she says, look, 15 years ago, I met this extraordinary woman at a home in Cheshire. She was almost blind, but she did phenomenal charity work for the local church and nobody had anything other than good things to say about her. So obviously, you know, like the reputation of a person is important when you're talking about these particular types of stories. But she goes back to this very old story. She says, look, um, at the end of World War II in the aftermath where uh, the British Raj was breaking up uh, in India, uh, she and her army colonel husband were living in India and then they moved to Nepal. And as they were traveling, she said it was autumn in 1947 and driving with them was this uh, 
a series of convoy trucks and a Gurkha guard, which are you know um, basically coming along with them as protection as they're heading to see Tibet. Like they're going into Tibet to see the Dalai Lama. Now, on this particular afternoon as they're traveling through, they get to the foothills of the Himalayas. And they all, when they get to the Himalayas, apparently there's this gray floating mass that's just sitting on the horizon. It's just there. Now, all of a sudden, this thing starts to get closer and closer and closer. And as this gray floating cloud, they've realized, gets closer to them, it starts sending severe vibrational like feelings through not only their vehicles, but also through them. They can feel the whole thing. It's like this immensely strong electrical field, which is just flying. Their skin is tingling. The trucks are shaking. A husband who is a trained soldier, obviously, is completely terrified by what's going on before them. Uh, he jumps in front of his wife. He kind of leans over in front of his wife. And as he does so, it's almost like he's struck by lightning. It's not actual lightning that takes place, but it's, he behaves in this kind of way. There's like this electrical surge. And she doesn't know whether he's dead or alive. Like he passes out from this thing. And one moment... He's there and the next second he's kind of leaning over the top. And she said, there's this unknown amount of time that passes because it's like it's over in a flash. It's just done. And she realizes that it's now dark. Now, everyone around, like she climbs out of the vehicle, her husband climbs out of the vehicle. They're all looking around and they're like, what's, what's going on? They were physically sick. They were vomiting. All of them developed this horrible red itchy rash on the exposed parts of their bodies, but nowhere, not where they had clothing. Uh, and they realize now that hours and hours had passed. It had just been a flash, just a moment, a moment in time, but hours and hours had, pla- had passed. Now, at first, I thought they might have been hit by a sandstorm or electrified tornado. Sometimes those things can actually take place, but that doesn't seem to be the case. This seems to be something completely different, and this is where Jenny Randall starts describing her natural phenomenon of time storms. This is why she, she coined the term time storm, because it's a, some form of electrical current that disturbs the flow of time. And that's, it, yes, there is Jenny Randall's on, yes, I can see the image that you, you've placed up there. So um, I thought, okay, well, that's, you know, that's pretty intriguing. So I wanted to see how much further she went with this. And she's like, well, I did. So in this uh, 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 art journal article, this newspaper article, I'm sorry, magazine article, uh, she describes the Averly abduction. This happened on October in 1974. And she actually met the family in 1978. Is this in Averly? Yes, that's right. Now, she thought, and this is what is really important about this, right? Because this kind of highlights this concept that, look, we go to, oh, I see an apparition in the house. It must be a ghost. Mm -hmm. Oh, I experience a light in the sky. It must be an abduction. Like, this is what this was thought to be, right? So, she actually took them for uh, regression hypnosis. So, she takes these these people that claim to have had some weird experience and uh, they're put under hypnosis. And All they remember from this particular experience is that it was five people in a car. They were driving along when this strange green cloud just appeared out of nowhere. Just because it's a green cloud, they don't care. They drive into it. But when they drive into it, they actually bump into it. There's like some physicality to it. It causes immense electrical interference all throughout their vehicle, including their radio sparking. Uh, This misty cloud kind of forms all around them and then disappears. Now they come back and once again, they've got missing time. They don't know they've got missing time. They only work out they've got missing time later on when they get home to see a, a television show that they wanted to see. And not only is a television show over, it's actually back then the TV station stopped broadcasting for the evening. Like, how is that possible? We're only a couple of minutes from home. How is... So she starts digging in, right? She starts doing the, the regression. And, you know, throughout the regression, you do get this weird alien sci-fi saga that comes out. Um, but the thing was, is that the adults recalled the different experiences. They recall really? completely different experiences, right? Now, that's that happens all the time, right, in multi-witness abductions, apparently. But it was, you know, it was something that was suspicious that they would, they would have this. And then she ended up pulling out through her experience other details that suggested that, no, they didn't actually get abducted. Whatever's coming from this hypnosis, who knows where it's coming from? And we know that that's a danger, right, <coughs> Mary Rodwell, that these things can, you know, start... <laughs> coming to the surface that might not entirely be, you know, a reflection, a true reflection of what took, pay, or I, what took place. I don't know if it's the same case, but I've got the paranormal scholar from YouTube uh, on the screen here. She's talking about the Averly abduction. Well, that might be it. Uh, I'm not sure if it is and, the same. And uh, I'm pretty sure that that's not some, some kind of time travel unless it's it's a ninja. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she, but, this, but my point is, right, and this is what, what um, Jenny Randall is pulling out. She's like, look, is it possible 
that they drove into some type of natural phenomenon, which does cause disorientation and confusion, all this kind of stuff. But everything else is a space age fantasy conjured up afterwards by the brain in an attempt to plug the gap. Why would you conjure this Batman on the screen here? Yeah, good point, right? Think about it though. So you've got masked beings, you've got some weird Batman, like the craziest things that you can pull out of your mind. The two eye, the two primary eyewitnesses had completely different experiences to recall. Yeah, but this argument always relies on the idea that your mind just comes up with these things for no reason. I think in this circumstance, look at another one, look at another weird kind of creature. They're not, they're not standard beings either, right, in this particular report. What I'm saying, I'm not saying that something didn't happen, but what I'm saying is that, and what Jenny Randalls has highlighted, is that they, they experienced something that was a natural phenomenon, which is still supernatural, even though it's natural, but it's unknown, it's unrecognized. And what happened was they immediately went to, we were abducted. Not they, they drove through a time slip. They drove through some time bubble. So is she saying that the entities that these people are describing are confabulated, they're not real? Look, she's saying there's a possibility here that they drove into an electric green cloud that took them instantly two hours into the future and everything else is a space age fantasy conjured up afterwards during this attempt to plug the gap. This happens on the false assumption that we make that there is a gap to actually plug. So yeah, they've got this two hours of missing time. So the missing time and the time storms and going into another dimension are all totally real, but the entities in this other dimension just must have been, the mind just must have confabulated. Well, the, I'm not, the mind just have, must have made them up. I'm not saying that, but I am... Well, Jenny I'm, Randall's is. Well, I'm, no, I'm leaving And he sounds open. like an idiot. I'm leaving that... I don't think so. I, think, I, don't, I think it's very unfair to call her an idiot because I think it's, um, I think it's a strong possibility. When you look at these stories, right? because what's what? That's what we do. We immediately go to. Why oh, wouldn't I've you just say time. the whole thing is a made up? Why wouldn't you just say the whole experience is confabulated? Because something happened. Why is only the first half confa- not confabulated, and then everything else they say happened is well, confabulated? I feel like you're being combative in this, but that's okay. Like, but what I'm saying is, is that we immediately go to. Oh, you have this weird experience. So you drive through some weird electrified green mist, and then you have two hours of missing time. That's all That's all in their conscious recall. Like, that's all in their conscious... It's all there. Like, they remember. They remember seeing the cloud. Oh, you're saying weird. everything else came after they were regressed? They were so. regressed. All that oh. other information came out when they were regressed. And that's why you said they were regressed like- by Mary Rodwell. Yes! <laughs> I know you're a bit I, sick, so you're a bit behind the eight ball. I get, there, it I get it I get it. But you see what I'm saying? So all of this happened consciously. They experienced everything consciously, but then all of a sudden... And they don't come home going... Oh, and look, I know that in abduction accounts, of course, it happens so frequently that people just have amnesia in regards to it. But I think that there's something to this, that there is this unknown natural phenomenon that people interact with, and it can result in strange things taking place. So maybe they had just finished watching American Ninja 4 like the night before. Yeah, possibly. <laughs> and when they went through this totally naturally see, occurring time tunnel, that, that says, <laughs> they that... just started to conjure ninjas. Yeah, and see, so this happened, this particular event happened in 1974, but this drawing was done in 1977. So you've also had three years for your brain to fill out a whole right. heap of other information. There's like three or four American Ninja movies that well, came out I just, in that time period. I'm I'm actually, and you'll get to, when we go into some of these videos as well, you'll see that, look, the, the whole time anomaly, you know, a proposition could be a reasonable explanation for some encounters. I'm not saying all of them, but it could certainly be for some, if not a number of encounters. And then, of course, you know, you have the Alan Godfrey case that occurred in November of 1980. And you know, one thing, I'm not going to go into the veracity of, you know, exactly what he recalled or what he experienced, but one thing that does stand out, right? He has a conscious recall. This is outside of any type of hypnosis, a conscious recall of a spinning gray mass that had strange physical properties at the side of the road. It caused the wet road to blow dry, uh, or just to become dry through blo- being blown dry. Um, he also writes that he was it was seen by other people at a distance and it had electrical properties to it, including causing vehicles to stop working. It also induced some sort of a, some sort of a spatial and temporal reality blink that was initially experienced by Dawn in Nepal back in that first report. So that one's not conjured. That one's well. That's physically. That's a physical recall, and it was witnessed by other people. Okay. So the, and the other thing as well in that previous case, there were five people in that vehicle that all saw the cloud. They all saw it. Like, they have conscious recall. It was only afterwards well, when they underwent f- hypnosis. There were five people put under hypnosis by Mary Rodwell. 
<laughs> right after yes, watching American Ninja Blood Hunt 3. We don't have to go into that in any greater detail. So what I want to do now, what time are we at? Okay, so what I want to do now then <laughs> is I wanted to bring up actually some uh, a, a collection of videos and I want to leave it up to you to work out whether or not you think this is in relation to a time anomaly or if it's some type of, of haunting, <laughs> right? And I want to see how you go with this. Now, the first one's a little bit of an outlier. The first one's a little bit of an outlier. Um, and you'll see where I'm going with. But this, uh, the first one, and I just called this one French Polt, but it's actually the Lazur Horror. And this relates to the Dupree's family that lived in Normandy. And uh, all of this started when uh, they'd lived in this particular chateau, this home, for over a decade, very much like the, the earlier report. They'd been in this home for over a decade. Nothing had ever happened. Nothing strange, no weird knocks in the night, you know, nothing like that at all. Until this one particular evening, there's this heavy knock at the door, like an un, and I would say ungodly, but there was something offset, you know, upsetting about it. This this knock, it's just a simply a knock at the door, but it's just odd. It's different to just someone just gently right, knocking. It's like a police knock. It's like a police knock. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. So she goes to the door and she opens the door and there's no one there. It's like this knock and run, but it's in the French countryside. And also she can see the gate and they've got this large gate. They've got this large um, fence around their property. And she looks down, she's like, the gate's locked. Surely you would see someone if it's You the would countryside. see someone, right? The, the gate's locked. And she's like, how is it that for whatever reason, how did they manage to get back through the gate without, did it make any sense to her? So she closed the door, but it was almost like a presence had moved through the door while she had, had left it open. She didn't necessarily feel anything, but there was uh, something that was off about it. So she goes back to having dinner or whatever they were doing. And that evening, all hell breaks loose in this house. And what I mean is that there is uh, rappings, knockings, poltergeist-like behavior, you know, strange things that are taking place. There's something in the attic. It's like something had walked up the stairs, had got into the attic. And she's just like, this is this is horrifying. You know, what, what is going on? So the following day, she calls. she's so upset. And her husband's kind of dismissive of it because he's like, oh, yeah, look, it's an old house. Even though the house had never made these noises before. So she calls her, her sister-in-law to come round. And her sister-in-law comes round and ends up uh, seeing something very unusual. Play number one for me, please, Ben. You got it. The men watched as it continued to do itself. And oh, stop for one second. Just one thing I will say, right? So when she had brought the, um, her, this is her sister-in-law. The, this is the Mrs. Dupree's sister-in-law. When she brought her around, because everyone was so freaked out, they asked other family members to come. They got a bunch of other family members to come to the house because they couldn't settle it down. And as they're all sitting there, uh, this armoire, this cupboard upstairs, suddenly starts vibrating and moving like something is, is inside it. Uh, and so they all go up to go and have a look. And this is what she's referring to when they're looking at this cupboard. Okay. Take the armoire apart and break it into pieces. When we went back up there, we saw the boards rising. They were in essence banging, just heaving. And then they closed the door to the bedroom saying that we shouldn't go in that room anymore because really, we, we were really afraid. She saw the armoire floating. They took it apart because this thing was rattling so much and making all these noises. They thought the best thing to do is to, to take it apart. So they take it apart and lay it on the bed. But when they lay it on the bed, the thing continues to vibrate and move. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is not, you know, it's a raccoon in there. Yeah, exactly. Well, they've taken it apart. You know, so how is this? How is this happening? So, um, with the the family, they're all there, and like it, it starts to escalate. Right, it gets worse and worse. More and more people that they bring about seems to cause the activity to really explode until they get to something known as the apple incident. More of the Dupre's family came to stay at the house. Each new arrival skeptical until he arrived. The newer arrivals were treated to a bizarre flying apple show that left the entire family in shock <laughs> and ready to move out. We all saw the apples. They came from the attic and passed through the door, making the a attic again. spot. Then they flew to the room next door. We didn't want to talk about it because we told ourselves people would say that we're crazy, that the whole family's crazy. When we touched one of the apples, it was hot. It felt very hot. Yeah, the old apple being hot. Yeah. And did you hear there as well? I might have been talking over it, but when these apples are flying through the house, they're actually flying through the house. They flew through a door and left this black mark on a door as they had passed through. But even black though, mark. But even though they were physical, right? Yeah, so with these poltergeists like 
interactions, usually when there's an app or some kind of physical object has appeared suddenly or is transported suddenly, it is reportedly hot. This is a feature of the phenomenon. Yeah. So it, them saying the apples are hot, yeah, we know what we're dealing with. Yeah, it's definitely some type of politica. But what's strange about this is it's just an older couple. They don't have any teenagers. You know, Older the- couple or sex magic practitioners? <laughs> mm-hmm. no, well, that's what I didn't point out, right? Is right before there was a knock <laughs> at the door, they did have a sheet of baking paper out and they were performing some type of weird sex magic. Right. And we know from some people what that is. The cop so- walked in and his face was just like, what? <laughs> no, this is different, right? Because they, uh, apparently, as far as we know, they weren't playing with anything like a, a sex or widget board or anything like that. Um, but there's this it's a sudden knock at the door and it's in. So is this like, as opposed to it being an actual poltergeist experience, is it some type of crossover? Is it that someone had come home in a previous time? This is a very old chateau. And this is why a lot of these things take place in older homes. Like, yeah, of course, hauntings can happen in modern homes, but they're more like, like what's the, the whole the old kind of perception that a haunting is taking place in an old home? It's always like yeah, an yeah. old abandoned mansion. If it was something like that, why would there be an apple floating through the air? <laughs> well, that's a, a good question. An right? old baguette's head. Well, yeah, that's that's a good question. Play the next one for me. We'll have a look at it. Is this number three? Yeah. One morning, I saw the image of a man exit the bedroom. He appeared before me in the hall. I was afraid. Very, very afraid. He put his hand on the door of the bedroom and suddenly disappeared. That upset me. It was the first time I had seen anything like that, and though I didn't believe in ghosts, I could not explain what I saw. So why would a ghost put its hand on the door and try and close the door? That that doesn't sound like ghostly behavior to me. That sounds like it's someone who is just going about their, their normal, you know, right duties, I suppose, in their home. Wondering who this old bitty in his yeah. house is. Yeah, so is this guy actually having an experience where he's in some time uh, in the past and there's some old, or in the future, and there's some old bag at his house and he's like, oh my God, the house is haunted. Yeah, I mean, just because the the ghost is acting like a, a normal person in their own time doesn't necessarily mean it's a time slip. I mean, how many cases have we covered where a psychic has been able to interview the spirit or communicate with the spirit Many and times. they they have no idea what the actual time is, what their situation. They don't even know they're dead. They're just stuck in some kind of loop, replaying out their their last days. Yeah, that, and that's when you do start crossing. That's a little bit strange because you are moving from residual hauntings to actually some type of of active phenomenon. But I think in some cases those active reports of where you actually are communicating with someone. I do wonder if you are communicating with someone across time. You know, is, is that what is occurring in these things? Like, it's not that, yes, they're dead from our time, but it's because they're stuck in their time. So it, it's different. No, they're actually dead. Like, they died. And, and there is just a spirit, spirit that is stuck and not aware that they're stuck. But that's the thing, right? Just think about it. If you got stuck in some type of time bubble somewhere. Some God sort, forbid. Some kind of time. I'm cop, in one right now. Time bubble, right? <laughs> and let's say it's like 2130 and someone's sitting in this office, even though th- this building is so terrible, it'd be gone by then. But still... Someone sitting in this office right now and they see you doing, you don't know you're dead, right? You don't know that you're just going about your duties. You're just going about your daily life. But it's like, yeah, it's like the same if, kind of thing. If a psychic walked in right now and she's like, Aaron, Ben, <laughs> you're dead. You need to move towards the light. And then this swirling, sh- just by the MU logo, <laughs> this swirling portal appears. Look, if there's one thing that sci-fi has taught me, never walk into a swirling portal. <laughs> Ever. What if you looked in the portal and this woman was on the other side? <laughs> Would you be like, hmm? Did you deliberately try to make her look like a grey there? Is that? <laughs> oh, God. That's a, that's a bit of inside <laughs> baseball. <laughs> Mary Rodwell on the screen. <laughs> but, of course, where I, where I come back to it, it's probably just a haunting, right? is that they get a French exorcist in and he lies on the bed. Problem solved. Okay. With the three Dupre brothers looking on, Michel Royer seemed to summon a strength to quell whatever forces seemed to be inside the bed. Later that day, he performed an exorcism ritual in every room of the house. And the Dupre say they never again saw or heard any abnormal events in their home. Problem solved. So what Get I'm in an exorcist, right? gets rid of the demons, problem solved. Why do you even have a documentary about this? You know, Barely a happening. Because <laughs> Exactly. Well, my theory is though, right, I don't think he did anything. 
I don't think he's an exorcist. I think <laughs> basically what happened... Are you saying Luke Jean Dupre or whatever his name was? Uh, Royal. Roy- whatever. <laughs> is something it French. A famous something exorcist. Uh, no, I, I reckon what happened is in this particular circumstance, is the phenomenon started, you know, coming, reaching a crescendo and then it went, but it's like energy, right? It comes in a burst and then it goes down. If there's some type of energy allowing these times to cross over, then of course it would come, the activity would skyrocket and then all of a sudden it would drop off. Mm. It's like this guy has come into the house, he's disrupted whatever energy or what something you know that we don't understand is going on and it's completely depleted it and of course the activity ends i wonder if that's because it just so abruptly ended as well normally with poltergeist stuff it abruptly ends when a child grows up or you know the the person that seems to be around moves somewhere else yeah but you've got hundreds of cases through history of demonic possession and an exorcist stops the activity right but we don't know what type of exorcism he did he could have just sprayed so you know gotten a bottle of perrier and just gone <laughs> You know, around the well, place. in the recreation, it looked like he was just lying down after a big breakfast. <laughs> so, yes, admittedly, it didn't look that exciting in the recreation. So, uh, before I go into the next series of videos, so we're, with that one, though, where are you at, Ben? Are you are you at Time Anomaly or Haunting? Am I a Jenny Randall's Time Anomaly or am I a Haunting? That's, that's really straight up. Uh, Jenny Randall. What? Oh, sorry. My mistake. <laughs> I'm... Um, I'm going to go with, that's a genuine haunting. You're going with genuine haunting? Yeah. Okay. All right. So then I go back and I, and I started digging around and I went to uh, Malcolm's Anomalies. Of course, we know Malcolm Smith, uh, a great writer. And um, you only recently covered some of his work, but I recall from, was it The Little Man? Uh, or was it The Faith stuff? Well, yeah, he's been writing about the little people stuff for a while. He was just pulling some of the stories from the fairy senses. Yes. Yeah. And that was the story of the the young, it wasn't a young man, it was a man who kind of faced these childhood encounters that he had when he was, what, six or seven, right? Yeah. Where this little man would climb onto his bed at night and kind of poke It'd him away. Yeah, that's right. And, <laughs> and then, then sever- him to someone? several of them appeared and they yeah. were arguing over what to do with him. Yeah, so this is what uh, Malcolm does. He pulls out, you know, some great reports and kind of puts them together from various sources. And he's done this recently. Well, I say recently. It's a couple of years ago now. But he's done this from the psychic researcher Harry Price. And Harry Price... Um, lived from you know the late 1800s to the mid 1900s, and he wrote an autobiography called Search for Truth, and he also wrote Poltergeist over England. But there's this one story that sticks out that comes from October of 1896, and I thought, okay, this is an interesting example of what of what possibly could be occurring. It fits in with the the theme of this show in the sense that uh, when he was a younger man, he must have been more than 15 years old. He was returning from school, and as he came home from school, he ran into some friends in, in Shropshire. And when he was uh, staying in Shropshire, they started talking to him about this old manor house. It was constructed possibly around the 1600s. No one really knew, but it was this respectable old building, but it was reputedly haunted, of course. So when they go, yes, okay, the most haunted house in England, I think this might be the actual Is it the house. Ball, it's the Bawley Rectory? Oh, it's not the Bawley Rectory. Okay, so no, 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 it's not that. It's, it. <laughs> it's a separate house in Shropshire. Um, but anyway, so as... Um, these young boys, you know, heard about this particular house being being haunted. They wanted to know if it really was haunted. Um, so they go to check it out. Now, what stands out is some of the reports about this. Some people have said that, you know, parts of the, the house, it had like a storeroom in it. And if you walked into the storeroom, um, it would kind of like, what was it? It was a church and... Oh, yeah, the, when they had people who lived there previously, I'm sorry. They had said they'd seen like... Um, animals moving through the house, pans of milk overturned, utensils scattered. Uh, there would be the pattering of children's feet in the galley, you know, all very typical hauntings that were taking place. So this, you know, these kids, they're kind of excited about this. So they go and check out the house. And like all ghost hunters of uh, the modern age, you can't take your old iPhone with you. You can't take your iPhone 7 and, you know, see if you can capture some photos of ghosts. They literally have to take a camera, like a big box camera, and then hold up a stick of magnesium powder wow. with a flash that you would light with a battery. And so, so when, you're not getting anything in other words. Well, when you're trying to take a photograph, <laughs> like you're there, you're just like having to just one moment, just one moment, and you're pouring magnesium powder in and you're setting fire to it. There's a ghost just waiting there. Yeah, exactly. Looking at their yeah. watch. <laughs> so they go into this particular house. They said it was 9 30 p.m. when we entered this this manor house. Um, and as he goes in, I'm sorry, it's 19. It was 1940 when he was describing this. So even then, people were like, oh, you wouldn't understand the kind of cameras that we were using. But it was half past 11. Nothing happened. Nothing happened until about half past 11. When upstairs, they said they heard someone uh, moving about as if they were dragging a chair. Then there's this heavy clumping as if someone is stomping around in clogs of some kind, stomping down. 
And they said this thing, whatever it was, it was, but it was like a person. It walked down the stairs. And they counted these 15 or so steps that it walked down. It paused. It did something downstairs. They were in another room, but they're listening to this going on. And they turn around and they watch as this thing once again walks back up the stairs. And they hear this clomp, 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 clomp as what they think is a ghost moving about the stairs. So they rush. They rush over to the stairwell to see what this thing is. And of course, there's, there's nothing there. And they said, well, perhaps this entity was uh, as afraid of them as they were of it. And that sets the scene for possibly what could be happening here. Because they're like, okay, an hour passed. And it seems like there was a pattern to this, this clomping that was going on. So they decide that they're going to take a photograph of the next time that it starts walking down the stairs. So this thing starts walking down the stairs. There's a silence for a few moments and it starts and it goes clomp, clomp. And as soon as it gets to the seventh thump, Mm. they ignite the magnesium powder to take a photograph. And it's an explosion. It's a massive, huge explosion. I don't know if they put too much magnesium powder, but it's a flash unlike what we would think, right? This massive flash text takes uh, takes place and an explosion. He says, whatever was walking down the stairs clearly stumbled down the stairs. <laughs> it fell down the stairs. It <laughs> fell down the stairs. As soon as, and he said, as soon as it fell down, then it was like this clattering of it running back up the stairs and disintegrating into nothingness. So it's like, whatever this thing was, even though they couldn't see it, what's the, who's That's the, Harry Price. Right. Even though they couldn't see it, um, there was like this, they could hear it and they could sense it. Mm. And it was like this thing interacting with, with them. So suggesting it's not necessarily a haunting. So there's some guy probably in the late 1700s walking down the stairs to find this explosion at his house (laughs) and then tripping and falling down the stairs and then not knowing what the hell's going. Another time distortion, a time anomaly. So you're definitely going with um, the Jenny Randall's time distortion on this one. I'm going with a time distortion on this one. I'm going, I think that this is some type of time anomaly because of the interaction that's taking place, right? But going back to Mike's book earlier on, he also looks at things like premonitions and dreams and all that kind of stuff. And this is all part of this rich tapestry, which is which is time anomalies, right? And I think this highlights as well how a lot of the stuff we talk about, right, we kind of try to assign meaning to it. And I mean, as many people do. So we talk about synchronicities and coincidences and weird dreams and we go, oh, you know, there's something, you know, really important about this that we have to, we have to pay attention to. So I bring you to what I call the plain dream. This is from 1993. It happened to John Cassidy and his wife, Linda. It was Friday, the 3rd of December, when John had this astonishing dream. Can you play uh, number five for me, please, Ben? I had the dream two or three times that particular night. It was as clear as bell. I was actually talking to someone through the dream, uh, telling them about the, the plane, that it was coming down, and whoever in my dream that I was talking to, I was saying that, uh, you know, it's all right. You know, no one's died. Uh, It's landed near houses and, you know, there was a flash beforehand. Um, But all I could really say, it was a a small plane, but I really don't know how many people were on it, but it wasn't a a great big jumbo jet. It was definitely a small plane. Who is he talking to in the dream? So he doesn't know. He describes this. He doesn't know who he was talking to, but what really stood out with this is that it was an insistent dream. Like people have recurring dreams, right? But recurring dreams normally happen over a number of nights, you know, and there's never any rhythm. Every time he went back to sleep, this dream would occur over and over again. So obviously for him, there's a great deal of importance to this dream. Like it's like this plane crash, like this plane crash, but it's a smaller plane. And, you know, what could it mean? So he goes to work because it was just so... Um, prominent in his mind. He starts talking to people at work and all these people at work are like, oh my God, like one woman's like, my sister's flying to Queensland today and you know, I'm really worried that you know she's going to be involved in a, in a plane crash. And then the wife is like, oh, well, don't worry about it because we've been, already been on holidays so we're not going anywhere so we don't have to worry about, you know, it, just put it out of your mind. It's just a dream. And of course, it just plays over on his mind all night, all day, I'm sorry, until it gets to that night. That particular night, um, there's the TV running and they hear something. I'd actually gone to bed, I was in bed, and uh, my wife yelled out, you know, oh God, you better come and have a look at this, John, it's, uh, your plane crashes on tally. So I walked out and I actually looked at the TV and I thought, you know, that's it. Dazed, shocked and injured, the survivors sat on the lawn of the house where the plane ground to a halt. So a plane did crash. A small um, de Havilland dove had taken off from Essendon Airport in Melbourne or in Victoria. Uh, it had clipped... Uh, power lines. And when it had clipped power lines, it had created a huge flash that was seen by witnesses. Oh, wow. 
In his dream, mm -hmm. he describes seeing the huge flash, right? This is what happened. No one was injured. The pilot, well, sorry, the pilot was mildly injured, but not, not you know, anything serious. No one was killed. They didn't kill anyone on the ground. But not, it like, had nothing to do with him. It was completely disconnected from him. No one around him was affected by it. Nothing happened to anyone. What is the importance of something like this? Like, why, why would you have a, like, it's a useless premonition. And I'm like, this might actually explain what like a lot of this stuff is actually some type of time anomaly as opposed to it being some type of directed cosmic force or fate or something like so that. So you're going for Jenny Randall's time storm <laughs> versus, Mary, versus Mary Rodwell aliens. Jenny Randall's versus Mary Rodwell. But the point I'm trying to make is, right, we assign meaning and all this kind of stuff, but there's no meaning because it's a natural time anomaly that we just simply haven't recognized. And this is why people have these weird dreams and these weird premonitions. But then, of course, you can have it in the other direction where it's far worse, right? It's far worse. Uh, then we go back to 1978, to August the 22nd, where we have the story of Elaine and, and, and Jeff. Um, something truly terrible uh, happened to Jeff. So uh, essentially, Jeff had had, no, I'm sorry, Elaine had had this uh, terrible nightmare and in fact, I'll let her describe, uh, you know, the nightmare that that she experienced. Oh no, hang on, if I missed it up, I've messed it up. Sorry, Ben. Just go for me to um, go number seven. No, go to number eleven. Number please. four. Number <laughs> number eleven, please. Number eleven. We're yeah. skipping. We'll like, skip Ghost Tree. Tranny Ghost One. <laughs> Tranny Ghost Two. You got all these great it's files ghost here. Ghost Tree. We'll come oh, back sorry. to that. Ghost Tree. <laughs> On Tuesday, the eighth of August. I um, woke up at six o'clock in the morning and I was really quite distressed. I was crying and shaking and um, my heart was racing and I, my palms were really, you know, perspiring and, and I'd had this terrible dream and I actually woke my husband up and I, I said to him, I've just had the most awful dream and I said, I dreamt you were dead and he actually thought I was joking and started clowning around until he realised how serious I was. And he said, what did you dream? And I said, well, all I could see was these huge flames and I could hear you screaming for help. And, um, you know, we just held each other really closely. I said, I just don't want to let you go um, because it frightened me so much. So we got up and uh, my mother was staying with us because my father was in hospital and Jeffrey and mum and I were, you know, basically talking about this dream over breakfast. And, um, you know, when Jeff went to work, Mum was saying, don't be silly, it wouldn't happen. And I, I guess in my own way, I put it out of my mind um, because it was just too horrible to think. So a, a horrible experience and something that's sitting in her mind, right? But of course, it's dismissed. It's dismissed by her mm. husband, Jeff, who was, you know, the person who was in the dream. What was his job? He wasn't a firefighter or anything. No, nothing like that. He just worked a, a normal job. I don't know exactly what his job was. But what I do know uh, is that he was a basketball umpire, right? So on this particular evening, the following the dream, uh, apparently what had happened was he would regularly on a Friday night or whenever this was, he would have a regular basketball game that he would have to umpire. And because there was something that had taken place and the facility wasn't available, they had cancelled this, um, this game. So he was on the road an hour before he usually would be. Now, because of this, he, um, was, he arrived home late and he was, he was home like, well, he didn't get home, right? Because he was, he was very, very late. And so uh, she's very concerned. She's like, well, why isn't he home? She starts calling around and because that dream starts to come back in her mind. And she's like, where is he? Play the video. We find out where he is. I was waiting um, for, the, for the news to come on, the radio. And at that time, I heard these cars pull up in a hurry. And I started to walk down the passage and I remember playing, you know, please God, let him be all right. And then as I opened the door, I could see um, two police cars and there was this police woman actually walking up the path towards me and um, and I, I just knew he was dead, I could just feel it. I mean, I'd already had this strong feeling that something had happened. Far out. A petrol tank had overturned on the Birkenhead Bridge and um, Jeff Wassey had nothing to do with the accident. He was trapped between the bridge railing and the tanker. And, um, you know, whilst I was actually making phone calls, trying to find out where Geoffrey was, 
this dream had come back to me, but I, you know, pushed it away almost. I didn't want to think about it, but I, I just knew something had happened. And of course, when I read the paper the next day, it, um, it, it actually said that there were huge flames and the driver could be heard screaming for help. And I knew that what I dreamt had come true. Gee, lucky she told him about the dream. Well, this is the thing, right? She told him about the dream and he had dismissed it. So this is where we do assign you know, important meaning to these sorts of things because had he not gone out that evening or like, it would have changed things. Like, so, But how would you know? Like, it wasn't his fault that the game got cancelled. No, what's all he supposed the- to do? Never go for exactly. drive again? Yeah, but all these things fell into place for this particular event to take place. And it would have been like, because where the tanker fell as well, it fell on the bridge. Had he not been on the bridge, he would have been able to swerve away. Mm. So it was like down to the like this perfect timing almost of where the tanker had fallen on a bridge with him having no op- no option. You can't escape all. your fate. And she and so what happened? What came out of this is that because obviously it's this is just ghastly. It's it's so horrible. Um, but for her, she ended up having another dream where uh, he actually appeared to her and consoled her. This is many years later. She was suffering from nightmares, and it kind of steered her in a new direction because. It actually gave her faith that there is something more, there is something greater. And she wanted to help a whole heap of people. She became a counsellor and was able to, mm. to guide other people through this. So this is an example of where, well, there is some importance to it. So I don't think this is a time anomaly. I think this is, what were the options again that you gave me? From so it's not, options? it's not a Mary Rodwell. It's not a Jenny Randall's time anomaly. <laughs> it's a Mary Rodwell cosmic that, order anomaly. This one is a cosmic order anomaly. You know, my wife didn't talk to me for a week because she dreamt that I ran away with a Latvian underwear model. You did, didn't you? <laughs> it was very, <laughs> it was so visceral. It was so visceral and real. She was pissed at me. <laughs> at least two or three days. Like she would barely talk to me. She's like, I can't believe you did that. What are you, you going to do? It's a dream. Exactly. It's a dream. Hang on a second. My dream, hang, too. But hang on a second. Did she happen to be a, um, a lesbian astrologer by any chance? Mm-mm. No? Okay. Well, no. there you go. Okay. I don't know. I couldn't get details. I kept asking for details. I'm like, so yeah, what were we doing? <laughs> so where did we, I don't know, where did we happen to meet? What was like, she where? wearing? What was the situation? <laughs> so what if she didn't talk to you for a week? <laughs> That's pretty funny. I wouldn't have either. Okay, so let's continue. We'll continue to see where we're sitting. So uh, I want to go back now actually to Ghost Tree. We'll do We'll do Ghost Tree, okay? And I think this will be the last one before we, we head into the plus extension. But um, this is the story of... Uh, where have I got this one here? This is Anne and Owen Daly. So this happened on August the 2nd in, in 1990. Uh, this is in a Sydney, a northern Sydney suburb. Um, you know, nothing spectacular, nothing unusual about this particular location, except for the fact that um, Anne has this incredible dream that she just can't get out of her mind. And it's about a, a tree that's next to her property. Okay. I went to sleep and then I don't remember what time it was, but sometime during the night, I just seemed to get this exceptionally strong message that made me wake up. And the message was, the tree next door is going to fall on your house. I said, oh, don't be silly, you're just having a dream. Um, there'd been some storms around at the time. Uh, I said, you're just having a dream. You know, go back to sleep. She said, no, no, I've had this really strong premonition that a tree's going to fall on the house. And we'd never had anything like that before. And um, But I still wasn't convinced. And I just said, look, just roll up. So... So what, right? Convinced like, what? It got cut off at the end. Oh, it's just like he wasn't convinced that there was anything in this, that it was this was simply a dream. But I'm like, it's a tree, right? It's a tree. But, you know, she does heed it. She heeds this dream because unlike, I mean, we all have dreams where things are just a little bit obvious um, in that we must uh, feel uncomfortable about them or we must, you know, take some type of action. But for the most part, they dissipate. But for her, it didn't. Like, it just kept on going. So she did things like she said her dog would have, you know, normally sleep under that tree. So she kept a dog inside that day, all those sorts of things. Well, she gets a phone call and it just so happens that this tree did fall down. Like it just suddenly fell down for, for no particular reason at all. There wasn't a significant storm or anything else. But I'm like, well, so what? I mean, you had a dream the tree fell down. Is this just one of these anomalies? Well, no, that happens to be greater significance, uh, more meaning to it. I wasn't terribly shocked because I was expecting it to happen. When I came home, I was fairly horrified because there was quite a, a lot of mess and I couldn't see what sort of damage had been done to the house. So there you go. Like she's <laughs> not worried about it. She could see the damage. 
But there was something else that had happened is that she and her neighbors are taking photographs of this tree just simply for insurance purposes. So they take all these photographs. It's 93, so they don't have um, digital cameras. So they get the film developed. But when they get the film developed, they see something very odd in the upstairs window. I had mine developed and there was nothing abnormal in them. And then when I saw this photograph that David had taken, I was convinced that it was my father standing in the window and my father had died three years before. Wow, conclusive. <laughs> I was the same. <laughs> I was like, well. <laughs> well, wrap that's, it up. That's abundantly clear, right? Ghosts proven. Right? But this is, so David is a neighbor who was taking the photograph. So it wasn't her photograph. She, he had taken this photograph. Um, but just finish off what she says there. Before. Oh, that's okay. Right. So th- this is the thing. It's like, okay, well, really? I mean, you saw the image there, Ben. Like, it's pareidolia. You could see anything. But it just so happens that she realized that this was a much younger image of her, of her father, like much younger. And she's like, oh, hang on a second. So she pulls out, oh, it's her grandfather, I'm sorry. Mm. So she pulls out um, this old wedding album that she had and she looks and it's this spitting image of him 40 years ago. Oh. And we will get to see it. So play the next video. This is the neighbors describing what they saw. Where she said it looked very much like it. And uh, she showed it to us. And, you know, you can see very real rel- resemblance. <laughs> it's no problem about resemblance. And I couldn't have identified it as, as a person. Um, but I've always been rather sceptical of photos that, you know, people have said had ghosts in them. But I know this photo wasn't doctored. So, you know, if, if there was something there, it was there when the photo was taken. Um, and when Anne showed us the, the wedding photo, it certainly looked like the father. That helped to give an image to what was in the, in the window. I'm sorry, but I can't see anything in that window. You can't see it? No. What am I looking at here? No, Where it, is this old man in the window? When it was superimposed, I could see it. So if you go back, yeah, go back to a little bit there. But yeah, it's a bit difficult to to see it. But the thing is, right, so I was going through this. I'm like, well, what's the importance of this? We find out later on that apparently Anne, so I'm like, is this about a tree? Is this a premonition about a tree that really doesn't do anything? It doesn't yeah. save anyone's life. But <laughs> yeah. they're just like, okay. <laughs> no, the whole I- point is that granddad was just in the window going, ah, f- <laughs> someone's got to clean this up. You're not too far from the truth because she <laughs> says, and she's like, what actually happened was three, her, her grandfather had died three years before. And just before he died, he'd been sitting in her house and she was like, look, they were going on to the more, you know, esoteric kind of topics. And she said, if you pass or when you pass away, if you can, if you can do anything afterwards, can you please send me a message of some kind, find a way to send me a message. And he's like, ah, oh, fuck, it's just, none of it's real. And he's like, oh, yeah, but I'll try. <laughs> if I can, I'll try. Now, she's convinced that that's what this was, right. that he had somehow orchestrated this situation to draw, like, it's ridiculous. Like, you're going to the, the this premonition of a tree. That's not what it was. It was all done to draw attention of her and the neighbours to photograph, or to get this photograph, and apparently of him sitting in there. Now, of course, it's difficult to see. I don't necessarily see it either, but I do find this to be intriguing. That. So you're going for Mary Rodwell Cosmic Order versus Jenny Randall's Time Storms. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyone who is listening to this and not watching the video has no idea. <laughs> and you know what? You're probably you're probably very lucky because you don't need to see We're that. just throwing various you pictures of Jenny Randall's throughout her career. You you don't need to see that. Um, now of course now the other thing before before we go actually, see so this has come actually from the classics. Right, this has come from the classics. If you can go to where is it? This is good old. He's dead. This I actually oh, came, he's dead. I came across this today. Just bring up um, uh, play number sixteen before just before you do. We'll go with number sixteen. This is Judy uh, Middleton who in her Tasmanian home in nineteen seventy. Uh, claims that uh, she had moved her husband's chair, or her father's chair, I'm sorry, from the living room into her bedroom. When she did so, her daughter, um, Heather, experienced something... Uh, ver- oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Jean. I missed, I messed them up. Wow, just This is up. terrible. I'm you need to retire up. right now. It's Jean <laughs> and Jennifer Mills Coppin. I've gotten them back to front. So Jean had moved her, um, her father's chair into her bedroom and Jennifer was a young child, like six or seven years old. She had lost her father and her grandfather, so she was already traumatized. But after they pulled this chair into the room, they woke up one night to find something. This is what they saw. Go 
I woke up in the early hours of the morning, wide awake, and I looked over in the corner. My grandfather was sitting there. Mum, there's Poppy in the chair. When I sort of opened my eyes wider, I could see that it was a man dressed in a um, double-breasted suit and a hat. Uh, I couldn't see his face. It was too, that was very dark. I kept looking and eventually it faded. It seemed to fade. It, it sort of was very ob obvious for a while and then it faded. It seemed to like it disappear. Time, time distortion or time distortion? Cosmic order. I don't know. That's, that's the only one half of the story. You've okay, got... well, okay, so the second half of the story is a classic, is that they would think that it ends, but then they experience something, out, or Judy sees something in her backyard. But Papa wasn't through yet. There was the day Jean was getting ready to do the ironing. She glanced out the window and swears she saw an old man out digging in the garden. Nothing strange about that, except... Oh, my God, he's dead. That old man <laughs> was Jean's father, Papa. <laughs> the reason that's funny is because Aaron made a little sample of that. <laughs> and we've played it very at various it's, times. It has been beaten to death, that one. But there it is, because people have asked for it over the years. So there it is, if you want to go and find it. But the reason why I included that, right, is because it actually does link to the other people I was describing, Brian, Judy, and, and Heather. Middleton, they're looking for a Tasmanian home in 1970. Uh, and Brent, just bring this down to old couple, um, the, the first one here. Now, just before you play this particular video, essentially what had happened was is that uh, Brian, Judy, and their daughter, Heather, had uh, gone into this house. Uh, it was on the market. And they're wandering through, and they like it. It's like a, a quaint little uh, Tasmanian home. It has all everything that seems kind of right with it. But apparently, Judy says that she feels that there's something off, and she feels like this immense cold. She walks into this one particular room, and it's absolutely freezing. Like, it's freezing. She's like, this is not normal. It was a penetrating cold is the term that was used. So she goes outside, and look, Tasmania can get cold, but this was in summer, where it's, it was balmy, it was nice by Tasmanian standards. So she goes outside, and when she goes outside, she looks back in through the window, and when she looks back in through, she's just, remember, it's an open home, so there are other people, but she looks in and she sees something very odd. Just play the first one for me. And there was an elderly man leaning over an elderly lady in a rocking chair. An elderly couple. He was wearing dungarees. She had a shawl wrapped around her shoulders. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know whether it was a ghost or what it was. It was so real. It wasn't just an outline. It was a solid figure, two solid figures there. And they were very, very real. But I knew they weren't there when we had looked previously through the house only a few minutes before. The next day, we went back and had a look and I again and I could see their faces at the window, this elderly man and elderly lady, they were looking out the lounge window and I never said anything and after that I went off the house completely. Can I just say that this woman really knows how to tell a story? <laughs> She, she's an elderly woman who's a, been traumatized there was by a, a man. ghost bed. I don't know if they were a ghost or anything. And then I looked out the window and then I saw <laughs> that they were there. And then I turned my head and then they were sitting at the chair. And Look, then uh, What's important is that this is an empty house. This is an empty house. There shouldn't be an elderly couple there. There shouldn't be anyone inside this home. And they certainly shouldn't be peering at the window. Um, but this is where I'm wondering, is this some type of time anomaly? Or is it a haunting of some kind? Because well, in the next video, Ben, going to number two, they... Obviously, as she pointed out there, she's feeling uncomfortable about this. She's gone off the house. But her husband says, look, let's drive past the house. We'll go and check out the house and we'll see how we feel. Does her husband tell more of the story in this clip? Because this is like staring at a talking piece of wood. Ah, uh, you've got more wood coming. <laughs> I try to reassure Judy that she could be mistaken or imagined it or, you know, maybe it's a trick of light or this something. This is Brian, the husband. But she was very, very um, positive that she'd seen this. As they approached the house, all three of them saw something unusual. Is that a tirana? It is. There in the front of the garden was a man, apparently digging potatoes. <laughs> a man wearing dungarees. Well, you see how you, you, the house is haunted and he's just digging up your front yard, yeah. burying <laughs> potatoes, like farming potatoes. <laughs> That's hilarious. A man 
Judy recognized immediately. She was angry. She was saying, he's the man, he's the man. He's in the garden digging potatoes. He's the man I saw. He was clearly digging. He didn't turn his head. I remember that. Um, he, didn't, he didn't turn his head, although I slowed down. I'm ex I expected him to because a lot of people who are working out front generally glance up, you know, to see a car going by. He was just digging. Very it's true, they do glance. That's really, they do glance, Aaron. That's really important, though, and that's where I started crossing into this. Well, is this uh, a ghost or is it some like a guy who is just going about his his day? He's digging in his garden, but in another time. There's some weird time bubble. I mean, I know that Jean-Claude Van Damme is about to walk into the garden and steal a potato, <laughs> but is this because that's what normally you would, right? If you hear a vehicle, and those tyrannas are loud as well, you would look up. You normally, if you're in the garden, you normally would glance up. Like you're kind of not so caught up in your world unless he can't hear it. He can't see it. Or maybe it's just some old guy. Maybe right? he's deaf. Maybe he's deaf. But then Heather, the daughter who was younger than is in the car, she describes what took place. Oh, I bet she's a barrel of laughs too. If it had just been a gentleman who'd been in our garden one minute with two sacks of potatoes and the next minute had gone, there'd be absolutely nothing unusual about that. Let's face it, he could have been taking them illegally and, and now had, had shot through. But I still can't explain how you could have got a large dug area piece of ground with potatoes in it and the next minute had it converted back to lawn. I still can't understand. Okay, so that's the most interesting part. The guy's digging a He's, plot of potatoes and then they go and check on it and the lawn. It's lawn. Okay. And this is the thing. So the previous day where they'd seen the, the couple inside the house, it had been lawn, like it had been turfed. And then they drive past and it's suddenly a vegetable patch where you've got some old guy digging potatoes. There's potatoes everywhere. And then they go and look straight afterwards to go and see who this guy is because it's not described in the audio there, but previously they had a discussion in the car and they say, well, he's on our property. We've signed the paperwork for this property. You know, it, it's our property. So they're going to go and confront him. They go and look and it's just back to lawn again. I'm going with time slip, time bubble here. Um, but then, but then there is another element to it in that they go and confront the real estate agent. And when they confront the real estate agent, apparently the real estate agent's like, oh, yeah, okay, you kind of got me. Uh, yeah, plenty of other people have pulled out. And he tore up the contract. Like he just, he tore it up there and then and said, look, you don't have to, to buy this house. What, that he thought that they were making it up to get out of the contract? No, no. He was just like, apparently other people have seen and experienced strange things and he wasn't going to make them go through with the sale. And the reason why he wasn't going to go through the sale, make them go through with the sale, uh, is described by uh, Wood, I mean, Judy. Wood, <laughs> Mrs. Wood. He had been told that there was a man and a woman in the house and the old lady had been missing and that the man, they were told, the man had been um, put, had probably killed her and buried her in the garden. <laughs> what is that at the end? My God, you know imagine what? coming home to her. <laughs> Every day. I'd kill her, put her in the garden too. She doesn't eat. She, you ask, how, how was your day, honey? And she just starts rambling about just utter nonsense. <laughs> and you just, you just, you just zone out. You just start. Well, maybe. Suck, maybe just start pouring a huge tumbler the, of whiskey. The, the kicker to this whole thing is that the old couple that they saw was them in the future. Yeah, right. <laughs> they killed her and this put her in the garden. I was burying her, burying her lifeless corpse. That's why he's got this happy look on his face. Look at him. So look, I don't, I don't know. Oh yeah, I yes, think, I did it. Uh, she deserved it all. I had to edit that as well. Like Mrs. Wood actually got edited because it was a lot longer than that. Her just getting to the point that the real estate <laughs> agent told me that they believed that the old dude had killed the old bag and she was in the front yes, garden. Yes, potato garden. That's yes, that's all it is. It's just potatoes down there. Nothing so, else. But is this like, so is this what it is? Is it some type of haunting because he's unable to leave the home because he's mm. committed this atrocious act and it's just playing over and over again? Or is it some type of time anomaly? Me is it a Mary Rodwell cosmic forces fate story or is it Jenny Randall's <laughs> time storms? <laughs> Did you generate that while we were talking? Is that no, an AI? Just Google image search Jenny Randall. Oh, okay. With All a right. few adjectives after the term. Okay, well, I'll link to all of that in the show notes at mysteriousuniverse.org. Check out it or not, just to see how you go. <laughs> Coming really up now. after the break, <laughs> tubing. What is it? We find out. Let's look at this um, fine stock of Americana. Look at these 
Nebraskans out enjoying the wilderness, enjoying their tubing activities. It was all destroyed when UFOs and aliens turned up and nearly put an end to this very popular tubing business over at Tank and Tube River Rides. We're going to be looking at the work of Jeremiah Johnson, who was there to document the event in his book, Trust the Light. And he became a UFO whistleblower um, only after the UFOs led him to trust Jesus Christ. Is Jesus piloting one of the UFOs? No. Okay. Oh. Well, no. Oh, well, that's to a To suggest down. something would be foolish. Okay. Uh, to, just, to suggest that would be foolish. Is he at least driving the boat that's pulling the, the tubes? Yes. Okay, well, there you go. All right. All <laughs> right, on, I'm in. He's on the jet ski pulling the tube. <laughs> okay, I'm in for that. Uh, that's coming up for our PLOS members. And I'm also going to be talking about this individual here, Ben Landis. Have you heard about this guy? No, you sent me a PDF of some DMT experiences. So I didn't get to read it today. He's been doing a DMT experiment uh, since late December. Oh, I do know who this guy is. And he claims he's made contact with entities, and his goal is to prove their status in reality. He's approaching them with mathematical equations that he doesn't understand that are provided to him by others, and he's trying to get the entities to give him an answer to these equations so that he can prove their existence. Isn't his understanding of these entities retarded? And I mean that in the actual definition of the word. Well, it's funny, like you read his first entries from December and he's like, I've made contact. The entities, they're benevolent. They're they're here to help me. This is going. And then you skip ahead to like January the 10th and it's like day three of trying to get rid of the 55 demons that have plagued my body. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're in my rooms, they're coming out of the walls, I don't know how to get rid of them. You just needed to listen to one episode of Mysterious Universe to know that that's never a good idea to engage with that. Yeah, so we'll look at that, we'll look at how he's going with his experiment. Uh, if you want to access, sign up to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Uh, get access today and you'll get access. I keep saying get access. That's fine. Just get it's access. Good. Just get access. To our plus extension coming up. We do a huge extension on these shows every single Friday. You're getting more than double the content if you sign up for plus. And of course, Plus members also get an entirely exclusive show. There's a concurrently running season that comes out exclusively for our members on every Tuesday in video format as well. Uh, all the details are on the website, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Plus members also get a higher bit rate uh, MP3 quality version of the show for the audio and a totally ad-free version of the show as well. And Emmy Max members get access to our massive back catalogue going back 16, 17 years worth of shows. Well, if it's a time anomaly, it feels like 16 or 17 years, but really it's like it's a few hours. Is is that what it feels like for you? Uh, (laughs) A couple of hours? You know what, though? When you look back, it does actually feel like it's a blink. It's really strange. Like, no. no. <laughs> For you, is it like me dragging your bare stomach over hot coals? 17 years <laughs> feels like 34. It feels like a solid but that's 34. That's time anomaly. It just feels different to each person, Ben. <laughs> Sub days, it feels like it's 34 years. Sign up today, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Thanks for listening. If you're on plus, stick around for the great stuff after the break. For everyone else, we'll catch you next week. Mm-hmm.